السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله العلي الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى أشهد أنه لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء الحسنى وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله صاحب المقام المعلى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم يأنن الذين آمنوا أن تخشع قلوبهم لذكر الله وما نزل من الحق ولا يكون كالذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبل فطال عليهم الأمد فقست قلوبهم وكثير منهم فاسقون صدق الله العظيم Honorable ulama, respected brothers, mothers and sisters, it is a fact of life that everything has an effect. Everything has an effect. And you and I, we are very familiar with the effects of especially worldly things and worldly phenomenon. But the one thing that we have forgotten, the one thing that has kind of faded into the background in our lives is that sin also has an effect. Sin also has an effect. In Urdu they say, Guna se insan nadamat paata hai aur neki se salamat paata hai. That sin brings regret to your life. And virtue brings peace, contentment, tranquility, satisfaction to your life. Sin has an effect, either in this world or in the year after or in both. And as this month of Ramadan commences, and as we soak in the moment of the first Jumu'ah in this glorious and auspicious month, we must understand that the most urgent requirement is for us to give up sin. Recitation of Qur'an is wonderful. Fasting, we all do. Salatul Taraweeh is meritorious. But after the fara'id, the most important thing is to give up sin. Many of us, we approach Ramadan with the mindset of what am I going to do? I'm going to read Qur'an. I'm going to dispense my zakah. I'm going to give additional charity. I will perform my taraweeh. I will sit for atikaf, but very few of us approach Ramadan from the perspective of what, I, what should I not be doing? What should I not be doing? And that's why we may put a pause on the sins in our lives, but we don't press the delete button when it comes to the sins that have become prevalent in our lives. We just press pause for the duration of 30 days, and after Ramadan, we go back to the things that we were involved in. So the urgent requirement this Ramadan, the urgent change that is required is for us to expel sin from our lives, to remove sin from our lives, and to stop with the excuses. You know, one of the excuses we give, oh, but it's a small sin. It's a minor sin. The scholars so beautifully tell us, that the distinction between kabair and sagair, kabira, sagira, that is for academic purposes. That is to show the gravity of some sins over others. But in reality, sin is major, all of it and any form of it. Because don't look at whether the sin is small or not. Look at how big is the being whose command you are breaking. Look at the greatness of that Allah whose limit you are transgressing. So anything which Allah has forbidden or anything which Allah has instructed and we are not doing, it is great, it is major, it is severe. We should not let the devil beguile us that this is a minor sin. It's not a major sin. And even minor sins, you know, they have this beautiful proverb. They say, don't underestimate a pebble. Don't underestimate a pebble. Because in the end of the day, a mountain is but an accumulation of pebbles. Don't look at a stone and say, this is a small stone. Because when you take many of those small stones and put it together, you get a mountain. So don't look at a sin and say, this is a small sin. If it becomes part of your life, Allah forbid, Allah forbid on the day of Qiyamah, it is brought before us at the size of a mountain. Simply because we thought that this was a minor sin. Another 
point of caution that the scholars sound out is that even if it's a minor sin, if you do it continuously, your continuous perpetration of a minor sin makes it major. By making it, by allowing it to become a routine, a standard, a norm in your life, that escalates it from being a minor sin to a major sin. So the one excuse that we create to kind of soothe and pacify our own conscience is that, no, it's a, ma it's a minor sin. The other excuse is this, that everyone is doing it. Everyone is doing it. Everyone will not lie with you in your grave. Everyone will not stand next to you when you will have to account before Allah. No one will be there when it will be said, اقرأ كتابك كفى بنفسك اليوم عليك حسيبا. Read your book. You can't say, oh Allah, but his book looks similar. His problem is his problem. Your problem is your problem. اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون. When these hands and these legs and these eyes start to testify against us, it will not be a valid excuse in the court of Allah that, oh Allah, everyone else was also doing it. Another excuse that we use for our indulgence in sin, and we have become very indulging in sin, is that, hey, it's very difficult to abstain. Of course it's difficult. That's the test of life. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's difficult, but it is not impossible. If it was impossible to abstain, then Allah would not have made it haram and forbidden in the first place. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah has given you the capacity. You just need to muster up the courage. You need to develop the willpower to be able to say, enough is enough. What say Allah? Khanukh is khanukh. My pronunciation might be a little out, you know. I come from that part of the country where there's a little bit more water. Alhamdulillah. May Allah alleviate that difficulty and that hardship that you people have. So those are some of the excuses that we make. But the time is now. The time is now. There is no better time for change. The reason why I have consciously, deliberately, with thought, decided to talk on this topic during the first Jumu'ah of Ramadan is because I find increasingly many of us look at Ramadan as an opportunity to accumulate reward. Very few of us look at Ramadan as an opportunity to change our lives for the better to remove sin from our lives, to become better Muslims. Because that's difficult. It is more difficult to give up one sin than to perform 20 rakats of Salatu Taraweh. It is more difficult to give up one sin than to give thousands of rands in charity. It is more difficult to give up one sin than to spend 10 nights away from the comfort of your bed and your family in the house of Allah. But that is more important than the Salatu Taraweh and the optional charity and the Sunnah Atikaf. Because sin is haram, it is forbidden, it is outlawed. You, you earn the anger, the wrath, the displeasure of Allah Taala. Another excuse that we use for sin is that no, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but Allah is most forgiving, Allah is most merciful. Indeed, indeed, that is our belief, that is our aqeedah. Allah is most forgiving, Allah is most merciful. There is no sin and there is no accumulation of sin that is beyond the mercy of Allah. But one scholar so beautifully writes under the commentary of the verse of Surah Al-Rahman, where Allah says, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ That that person who fears the day when he will have to stand before Allah, for him is double the reward. And the scholars say, even if Allah forgives you, don't you feel ashamed? That one day you have to stand before Allah, knowing what Allah did for you and knowing how many of Allah's commands you broke in return. You know, as a kid, as a youngster, you knew that ultimately my father will forgive me. No matter what I do, I can smash his car, I can break something that's valuable to him, but ultimately he'll forgive me because he loves me and I'm his son. But the fact that you were disappointing him is what discouraged you in the first place. That even if my father forgives me, how do I stand in front of my father and say, Dad, I have failed. Dad, I smashed your car. Or I scratched your car. 
that look of disappointment will break my heart more than the anger and the outburst or even the hiding that my father was likely to give me. So even if Allah forgives us, we need to contemplate and think with what face do we stand before Allah on the day of Qiyamah knowing that we were sinning in a wanton way. Sin had become part of our routine. Sin had become so part of our lives that we did not even realize to what extent we were sinning. Somebody gave an example. It's a crude example, but it hits home very hard. He says, when an average person goes to the toilet, he gets the foul smell. But when the toilet cleaner is in the toilet, he's become so accustomed to the environment that he doesn't get the foul smell. When a person in whose life sin is an exception, as soon as he sins, he feels that guilty conscience. He feels that prick at his heart. But you and I, we have sinned so regularly, sin has become so part of our integral routine that we no longer realize that we are sinning. We no longer realize that we are breaking the commands of Allah wa ta'ala. The transgressions of the tongue, the lies that we speak, the exaggerations, the gossip, the slander, the transgressions of the eye. We don't control our gaze. We look at that which is not permissible for us to look at. The transgressions of the heart, what we think about, the hatred, the jealousy, the animosity, the lack of empathy, technology has made sin so accessible. You can be sitting in the house of Allah and you can have a direct connection to that which is sinful. These talks are not meant for us to judge the next man. It is meant for us to judge ourselves. It is a great bounty of Allah upon us that Allah is making sattari. Allah has put a veil over our wrongdoings. If people had to know what is truly in our hearts and what we do when we are away from the gaze of others, we wouldn't have the courage to show our faces in public. We wouldn't. And Allah through His benevolence, through His grace, through His mercy has kept a veil on our wrongdoings. But when are we going to start feeling embarrassed? When are we going to start feeling some tinge of regret and remorse? Who knows this could be the last Ramadan in our lives. Are we going to seize the moment and say, there is no better time for change. The time has come. The time is now when I need to abandon sin. When I need to unshackle myself from the burdens of sin. When I need to remove myself from the rut and the routine of sin. One day, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an asked Ahnaf bin Qais, they tell me, O oh Ahnaf, who is a jahil? Who is an ignorant person? Who is a fool? Right? So Ahnaf said, and listen to the definition that Ahnaf gave. He said, that man, that man who destroys his akhirah for some material gain for himself. In order for you to achieve some worldly item or some material progress, you destroy your akhirah. That person is a jahil because this world is temporary and akhirah is everlasting. But then Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu told him, Ahnaf, good definition. But let me tell you who is ajhal, who is a bigger fool. That person who destroys his akhirah for somebody else's dunya. That person who destroys his own akhirah for somebody else's dunya. How many sins don't we perpetrate to keep the wife happy, to keep the husband happy, to keep the children happy, to keep up with the Jonases, to sustain peer pressure, to fit in, to blend in, to be one of the guys, to be one of the clique, to be one of the group. Umar bin Khattab anh, said, that man is the biggest fool when he destroys his akhirah for somebody else's dunya. One scholar so beautifully said one day, there are four things that are worse than sin. There are four things that are worse than sin. The first, to trivialize the sin. That, ah, it's not a major thing. It's a small sin. The second, to commit a sin and then become happy. Hey, you know what I did? Where I was last night? How we enjoyed ourselves. So you committed a sin, you broke a command of Allah, and then you become happy of it. The third is, 
to allow that sin to become a continuous habit in your life. And the fourth is to commit a sin and then boast about it. To commit a sin and go in public and put it out there for everyone to see that this is what I did. This is what I was involved in. These four things are worse than sin. The realization with regards the harm of sin has left our lives. Sin makes you ungrateful to Allah. The height of ingratitude is we use the bounties which Allah has given us, including our limbs and our bodies and our life to break the commands of Allah. One sin leads to another. Sin breeds disobedience. It takes you further away from the Sirat al-Mustaqeem and further away from the mercy of Allah wa ta'ala. The biggest irony in life is we commit sin to bring ourselves happiness. But sin will never bring you through happiness. Allah says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ No matter what you do, you'll only get superficial enjoyment if you're breaking the command of Allah. That's why you see today, you have these movie stars, these superstars. They have all the money, all the women, all the glory. They have palatial homes. They have private jets, yet they can't sleep at night. Yet they are suicidal. They are popping pills. Why? Why? There's no inner contentment. That can only come when you are an obedient servant of Allah. So giving up sin will bring us benefit in this world as well. Apart from the fact that in the akhirah it will lead to salvation. When you sin, your relationship suffers. There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where the Nabi of Allah says that if you see this turbulence in your relationships with others, be it your spouse or your children or your siblings or your employer or employees, it's time to check the state of your relationship with Allah. The stronger your relationship with Allah, the more Allah will put barakah in your other relationships. But when you are breaking the commands of Allah, then no matter how in love you are with your spouse or what a good parent you are or what an obedient child you are, that turbulence is bound to set in because there is no barakah. You know, Ibn Kathir has made mention of this narration. And generally, we only like positive thoughts. And in the main, we also deliver positive discourses. But every now and again, we all need a wake-up call, myself included. We all need to be frank, and we need to be brutally honest with ourselves. You know, Malik, the gatekeeper of hell, it is mentioned in the 25th Jews of the Quran, وَنَادَوْ يَا مَالِكُ لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكَ the inmates of hell will call out unto Malik and say, tell Allah we want nothing. We don't want Jannah. We just want death so that the punishment can stop. And Malik will say, no, it can't happen. Inna kumma kithun. You have to remain. That's the decree of Allah. So the people of hell will cry. And they'll cry to such an extent that rivers will flow with their tears. Ibn Kathir has made mention of this narration. And after crying rivers of tears, you know, as the description goes, they look up to Malik, you know, like the kid, when the father says no, then they cry so much to soften the heart of the father. Now they look up to him and say that, okay, is there any mercy here? Do you see how we're crying? How much we regret? How much remorse we have? We only want death. We don't want Jannah to stop the torment and the punishment. And then Malik will say those words that send a shiver down the back. Ma ahsana hadal buka. Your crying is so touching. It's so sincere. It's so laden and full with regret and remorse. Loka nat fit dunya. If only you were crying like this in the world. Why did you leave it for now? Why did you leave it for now? So this Ramadan is a moment of introspection. To, to what extent am I sinning in my life? And how do I start eradicating and expelling and removing sin from my life? That's the greatest need this Ramadan. There's no better time for change than now. We should not only be changing in terms of doing optional good deeds. That's, that's meritorious. But change means you need to start giving up those sins which have crept into your life. And the beauty of Islam is, as much as there's khawf and fear, there is much more raja and hope. The doors of repentance are wide open, especially in this month of Ramadan. We know Allah says, you take one baby step in my direction, I'll come running to you and I'll embrace you. Collectively, the doors of repentance are open. Until just before Qiyamah. 
individually. Hatta you ghar until you are in the final moments of your life, you turn to Allah with sincere regret, and Allah is willing to forgive. Under the commentary of the hadith, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, look at the mercy of Allah. At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kamalla dhamba lah. Allah says, when you repent sincerely from a sin, it is as if you never committed the sin in the first place. The scholars write, when you make sincere tawbah, Allah removes that sin from the book of deeds. Allah removes it from the memory of the angels who wrote it. Allah removes it from the memory of the heavens that witnessed it. Allah removes it from the memory of the earth upon which it was perpetrated. Only you and Allah know that you committed that sin. The slate is wiped totally clean. Come back to Allah. Come back to Allah. There is no better time to change our lives than now in the month of Ramadan. The hearts are soft. The devil is shackled. The nafs is subdued. The environment is conducive. Make this Ramadan that moment in your life when you change for the better. A stepping stone towards true and genuine repentance. Allah says, You want to be successful, then turn to Allah in true repentance. Who is there to forgive sin except Allah? Allah says, Knock on my door. Knock on my door. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ No matter what sin you have committed or how many sins you have committed, never become despondent of the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sin, every sin, and the greatest accumulation of sin, Allah is willing to forgive. There are 66 verses in the Quran where Allah is calling us towards repentance and forgiveness. Allah has 99 names. Not one of those names talk directly about punishment. But multiple of the attributive names of Allah wa ta'ala talk about the mercy, the forgiveness, the tolerance of Allah wa ta'ala. It is for us to tap into it. It's there all the time. But it's found more so in the month of Ramadan. Actually, the mercy of Allah is so great. that There's this narration in Kanzul Ummal, subhanallah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ لَيَنْفَعُ الْعَبْدِ بِذَنْبٍ يُذْنِبُهُ Allah will benefit you. Allah will benefit you through the sin that you have committed. There's another narration of Ibn Mubarak. إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيُذْنِبُ الْذَنْبَ A servant of Allah will commit a sin. فَيَدْخُلُ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ And as a result of that sin, he will enter Jannah. How so? When you commit a sin, but thereafter you show genuine regret and remorse, it makes Allah so happy that not only is Allah willing to forgive you, Allah is willing to substitute in place of that sin a good deed that you never carried out in the first place. So your sin becomes a stepping stone for you entering Jannah. If you make tawbat and nasuha, if you are sincere in your regret, and in your remorse, Allah says, Ya bin Adam, O son of Adam, Inna kama da'utani wa rajawtani ghafartu laka wa la ubali. No matter what your sins are, turn to me, I'll forgive it. There's nothing. It's nothing for Allah to forgive. Law balagat dunubaka anana sama. Even if you have committed so many sins that it would fill the earth right up to the heavens. Turn to Allah. Turn to Allah. And Allah is willing to forgive. Allah is looking for every excuse to forgive us. All that is required is for a few hot tears of regret. A few moments of sincere repentance in the court of Allah. When you make tawbat and nasuha, when you repent to Allah, when you use Ramadan as a moment to change your life, to become a better Muslim, to remove sin, you'll see how much lighter you feel, how much happier you are. How much more barakah and blessings there will be in everything that you do. That's why one youngster came one day to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was crying and he said, Ya Rasulullah, wa dhunuba, wa dhunuba, I have so many sins. The Nabi of Allah told him, make this dua, Allahumma maghfiratuka awsa'u min dhunubina wa rahmatuka arja indana min a'malina. Oh Allah, your mercy is greater than our sins. And we have greater hope in your mercy than in our own good actions. That is the mindset of Islam. Forgiveness is readily available. I'll conclude by mentioning one or two more things. Musa alayhi salam one day asked Allah that, Ya Rabb, O oh Allah, 
How do you respond when somebody who's making dua to you calls out to you? So Allah says, I respond by saying, Labbaik. He says, Oh Allah, when a person who is, is a Zahid, he's totally left the dunya, totally focused on ibadah, when he calls out, out to you, how do you respond? So Allah says, I say, Labbaik. And then Musa alayhi salam said, The fasting person, when he calls out unto you and he says, Oh Allah, how do you respond? Allah says, I say, Labbaik. And then Musa alayhi salam says, When the sinful person turns to you, Oh Allah, how do you respond? Allah says to the sinful person, I say, Labbaik, Labbaik, Labbaik. So Musa alayhi salam said, But that is a sinful person. And on the other hand, you've got a fasting person and you've got a supplicating person and you've got a person who's totally engrossed in worship. Allah said, Musa, those people are turning to me and having reliance on their good deeds. This sinful person is turning to me and his reliance is on my mercy. He's got no good deeds to rely on. He's relying solely, wholly, only and exclusively on my mercy. That makes me so happy that for him I say, Labbaik, Labbaik, Labbaik. I'll mention one more story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and I'll conclude. There was a young man in the time of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, according to this narration of Ibn Qudama. And this young man had sinned to such an extent that Allah had commanded Musa alayhi salam to banish him from the town. And years later, Allah sends a revelation to Musa alayhi salam that one of my servants has passed away in the desert. Go and perform his janazah salah. And tell all the people that whoever accompanies Musa to perform the janazah of this man who's alone in the desert, just by performing his janazah, your sins will be forgiven. Musa alayhi salam went with a big contingent of followers, anticipating to see a great sage and pious person of the time. When they came there, they found the body of that very same boy who was banished for his sins. And Allah said, Musa, you know what happened when he was in the throes of death? He looked right, he looked left, he looked everywhere. There's, there was no one for him. There was no one to support him. Then he turned to Allah and said, oh Allah, everyone has forsaken me but you. Everyone has forsaken me but you. Allah says, Musa, his toba was so powerful. Not only did I forgive his sins, I instructed my Nabi to perform his janazah. And I put an offer on the table that whoever will participate in his janazah, their entire life of sin will be forgiven. So Tawbat al-Nasuha is what is the requirement of the time. There's no better time than now. The hearts are soft. The devil is shackled. The nafs is subdued. Ramadan is about giving up sin and removing sin from our lives permanently. Tawbat al-Nasuha is what? That you must have such hatred for the sin after committing it more than the desire that you had for the sin before you committed it. That is Tawbat and Nasuha. Let me leave you with this message of hope. One of the greatest personalities, one of the greatest personalities in the history of Islam is Abdullah bin Mubarak. But Abdullah bin Mubarak was not a pious person initially. Like they say, every saint has a past, but every sinner has a future. He was a drunkard, he was a womanizer, and one day after he woke up, from his drunken stupor, he heard a verse of the Quran being recited, the verse which I recited in my introduction. And that's the core of the message to myself and to you. My intention was not to depress you, nor to instill fear in you, but to give you hope and motivation that there is no better time for change. What was the verse? Alam amanu an wa ma nazala min al -haq. The Quran asks the question that, O oh Muslims, has the time not come for you to now change your lives, to now become the true servants of Allah? To now truly subscribe to the Quran. He was still drunk and he said, Bala ya Rabbi qad'an. Allah, the time has come. The time is now. There is no better time for change. When you make Tawbat and Nasuha, Atta'ibu Habibullah, you become the beloved of Allah. Atta'ibu min al-dhambi kamalla dhambala. When you make Tawbat and Nasuha, it is like you never committed the sin in the first place. When you make Tawbat and Nasuha, Allah protects you from the devil. Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. When you make Tawbat and Nasuha, then at the time of your death, the angels will come to you. Inna al-ladhina qalu rabbun allahu thumma istaqamu tatanazzalu alayhimu al-malaika. 
ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون. May Allah make this the best Ramadan in my life and in your life. May this Ramadan be the Ramadan of true repentance and tawbah. May we seize the moment for change and may this Ramadan effect everlasting change for the better in our lives and make us truly obedient servants of Allah. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. As always, I will be failing in my duty if I would not to acknowledge all the trustees for being so kind to warmly extend an invitation to me to once again meet and with my brothers in Islam here at Masjid Al-Quds. It's always a pleasure. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.